Father, we thank you because of yet another privilege and opportunity to gather at the table of the Lord spiritually and to get the best from your word that we need for the day in which we live. Father, we are praying that the blessings in the word as we study will be ours in Jesus' name. Amen. Pray that we'll know the reality of your divine support, of your help, as we pass through different situations in our lives and in our Christian walk with you. Show us your own will. Show us your own way in your word that we may live lives pleasing unto you in the world in which we live. In Jesus' name we pray. In our study of scripture, we are in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. It's wonderful to read the passages of scripture that we're reading. You want to understand that when the early church started, many of the experiences that they were having were sort of strange to them. And except that they were filled with the Holy Ghost who was then teaching them all that they knew. Many of these things would have just scattered them or unsettled them. But because every time they were being filled with the Holy Ghost, yielding to the control of the Holy Ghost, all the things that were happening to them became, let me say, a plus in their lives rather than a minus. They turned it into positive. They were getting advantage over everything because the Spirit was leading them and was leading them according to the Word of God. Uh, we're still in chapter 4, and it's such an exciting chapter for the church. You want to understand that the church is the light of the world, Jesus said so, and the salt of the earth. And yet, when the church is shining as light and is uh, sweetening everything around as salt, it's not without some reaction from the people around. It is so because there is a devil in the world, and uh, that devil is the enemy of God and the enemy of righteousness and the enemy of the people of God, and he will do everything to motivate and move people against the cause of righteousness and against the way of the Lord. Now you realize that as we're looking at chapter 4, chapter 4 actually is the response or the reaction or the effect that we have from chapter 3. Uh, the whole thing actually started from chapter 3 when Peter and John, wonderful apostles, they manifested the power in the Holy Ghost and they exercised the authority in the name of Jesus. You know many people in the church, that is all they want. Power, authority, miracles, signs, wonders. And uh, you know sometimes we pray and we say, well God, uh, give me the power, give me the authority so that when I lay my hand on the sick, they will recover. But can you take what comes after the miracle? after the sign, after the wonder, after the marvelous things that are being done. So Peter and John went to the temple, I'm just reminding you, and he saw the lame man, and by the power, the face in the name of Jesus, they told this man to rise up, and he rose up. And according to Acts chapter 4 verse 22, it says, For the man was above 40 years old, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. It was a spectacular scene that gathered the crowd and they started preaching. Listen to me. It's not just the miracle. It's the message as well. If, you have, if you're asking for power to work miracles, you must also be asking for wisdom to present the message of Christ. And so as they were preaching, the chief priests... And a captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They were grieved. The original says they were just indignant, furious, unhappy. Because they were preaching, number one, they were preaching Christ. That everybody believed that died, but they were saying Jesus Christ is still alive. Then they were preaching the resurrection of Jesus. And you know the authorities in Jerusalem had given money 
to the soldiers and they have told them just say that Jesus was stolen but now they were preaching that that Jesus that the authority said was stolen is actually risen from the dead and thereby they were also preaching the hope of the believer the resurrection of the dead so they laid hands on them and that is I told you last week that that is persecution and I read the Bible to you that the Bible says that anyone that will live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution and I gave you seven principles last week and it's so important because if you're a Christian if you're a believer persecution will come one way or the other now you must understand that the devil is not an idiot the devil is not dumb the devil does not apply the same method in persecution to everybody to to all the churches all the time from the beginning to the end uh, the devil has strategy and plan now uh, we're reading the persecution in the acts of the apostles and you may feel when the devil is going to raise up persecution against me it's just going to come as it was in acts chapter 4. no it's not like that you know all over the world we have christians and according to the word of god anyone anywhere who will live a godly life will suffer persecution but you realize persecution in russia is different from persecution in america and that's different from persecution in brazil or south Af south america that will be different from persecution in england that will be different from persecution in africa and even within a particular city persecution of a particular christian may be different from persecution from another christian it's uh, just showing us that the devil is resourceful in persecution and if he knows that if your body is attacked if you attack physically in persecution it doesn't uh, harass you it doesn't molest you it doesn't do anything to you he will come in another way and just be very subtle about it do you know something in the early church the persecution was so great starting from acts of the apostles and as the acts of apostles went on the persecution developed and uh, in the early church there were believers who were so eager to even be persecuted that they were they were literally run into persecution deliberately they will do things that uh, will make people persecute them and i've told you before polycap i've told you before other people in the church they just they didn't worry about persecution history tells us that uh, chrysostom one of the church fathers when the emperor called him and said well you are preaching christ you'll be persecuted you'll be separated from all your friends he said no you can't do that because my best friend is in heaven he has told me i will never leave you i will never forsake you you cannot separate me from my friend well he says well we'll take all your land from you anything you have everything you have will we'll take away from you he said no you can't do that because actually my inheritance is in heaven you know everything they did to threaten him there was nothing that could beat him back because at that time the persecution was not something that you know the believers feared eventually they banished him and when they banished him and sent him away to a far place his influence in writing was still so much that the emperor did not know what to do with him and they were going to banish him to another place eventually he just left the earth and went to glory but uh, the devil is changing uh, don't you don't think that you know the persecution will come to you in the same way that you know maybe they will beat you or slap you or you know send you to prison because you are a christian because you love christ because you are living a righteous life oh no it may just be ridicule reproach or shame or people abusing you or people separating you from themselves and you know some of these things sometimes they are more touching than a literal beating or literal physical sin and that's why we're looking at this word of god on persecution even though we're talking of persecution of the church in acts of the apostles yet when you analyze it it's the persecution of the individual christian 
you are a believer, you are following Christ, and therefore there will be persecution. And last week I told you seven principles. Number one, I told you you must be submissive to God and submissive to the people. You don't fight back. You don't talk back. And you must lovingly and graciously bear everything that comes away, counting it as an opportunity that you are suffering for Christ. Number two, I told you, according to the word of God we're reading, in persecution, be filled with the Holy Ghost. We're told in the Bible, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's in the continuous tense in English, be being filled with the Holy Spirit, which means as the opportunity comes. Be filled. Another opportunity comes. Be filled. Keep on yielded to the Holy Spirit. And then he'll put the word in your mouth. He'll put the action in, in you. To be able to do the right thing. I told you number three. Be bold and be wise. Be unshaken in your commitment. Then be wise in your communication. And number four. I said you must keep on respecting the persecutors. Loving them with the love of God. And praying. For the blessing of God upon them. Number five, I said, you must bind yourself closer together with the people of God when you're under persecution so you can draw strength from the people of like precious faith. I'll be saying more about that in the study today. Then you pray and bless the Lord. And then you ask God for greater boldness and faithfulness. You know, there are believers that have the wrong attitude to persecution. In fact, uh, uh, the more years you spend in Christianity, it appears the more methods you develop as a Christian, individual Christian, the more methods you develop in avoiding persecution. You are on the defensive. You, you are protecting yourself all the time. And you do everything so that nobody will talk against you anymore. So that the major part of the persecution of believers goes only to the young Christians. And if you're doing that, you're missing a lot from the Lord. You know there are believers who are so bold and aggressive and the people of the world will never, never think of persecuting them. Because anytime anybody is going to challenge them saying, you're a Christian, you follow the Lord... Well, they keep on a bold front, an aggressive front, and they are ready to fight. They are ready to say, you don't, I'm not an ordinary Christian. I've been a Christian for years now. If you do that to me and you try to persecute me, I'll show you something. Uh, you know, if you are like that, you're no more where you ought to be in Christ. Because anyone and everyone that will live a godly life will suffer persecution. And it's unfortunate that the more years you spend in Christianity, the more years you spend in Christ, the, the more you develop methods of just avoiding persecution. Let me show you some scriptures concerning the good in persecution. James chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse or different temptations, trials, persecution. Tell me then, where is your joy? Where is the evidence, the, the sort of testimonial that you are a believer if you have developed methods in avoiding the persecution of everybody? Uh, everybody around you, it says, my brethren, if you're still a brother, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing or lacking in nothing. That is telling us that when persecution comes, it's developing a sterling quality in you. Patience, perfection, and it comes to the stage where you lack nothing in your character, in your conduct. You are built up, you are matured by persecution. In First Peter chapter 4, I'm reading verse 12 to verse 14. Beloved, think it not strange concerning fairy trial, which is to try you, test you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, 
and as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. You hear that? The only way the, the weight of glory will be upon you is that today, as a Christian, as a beloved in Christ, you live a life that is so challenging, so arresting, so influential, that the people will know that you love Christ. And if they do not love Christ, the suffering they want to bring on Christ, they will bring upon you. That's why it calls it Christ's suffering. And then it says, when the glory shall be revealed, you will be glad with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is even spoken of, on your part, he is glorified. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that, ye have suffered a while. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. You see, persecution is uh, something positive. It's something glorious. Now, this doesn't mean that you foolishly uh, send yourself out or for persecution, as some people did in the early church. They wanted persecution so much. And when people were not persecuting them the way they wanted, the way they expected, they just ran out and uh, they, they courted persecution. They wanted it so much, uh, they ran into the jaws of trouble. No. I told you yesterday, the Christian is a peacemaker. He's a peace lover. He's going his way. And as much as lies within his power, he's at peace with everybody. But everybody is not going to be at peace with him. But then when the persecution comes, it will establish, it will establish you, it will strengthen you, it will perfect you, it will develop and mature you. In Second Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading there in verse 12. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So then, persecution has a benefit for the Christian. Persecution has a, a developing quality, a maturing quality for the believer. And it's not something we avoid by all means. We don't run after it. We don't invite it. We don't do something deliberately to earn it. But then, if it comes, and it will come, different sizes, and different parcels, in different shapes, in different models. But then, if it comes, in a slight way or in a heavy manner, from an individual living with us or from a group of people, we bear it. And we apply these seven principles I've shared with you to be able to uh, keep our Christian grace. But then, in Acts chapter 4, Verse 23, being let go after the, they had stopped the persecution for that time, being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Let's stop there. This is a wonderful effect of persecution. Persecution drives believers together in love and communion. You see, they, they, they threaten them. And he said, they must never speak of the name of Jesus anymore. They must not tell any man of the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the salvation and redemption coming through Jesus Christ. And after they are threatening them, they let them go. And then, you see the first place they went? They went to their own company. They went to believers like themselves. Persecution drives the church together. Stay with me. Now, before persecution, you know what the church is doing? I don't mean the early church, but I mean the church of today. 
the church that has no persecution generally is a prayerless gossiping church you know when things are easy when when life is you know all right there is money and life is you know we just enjoy life and we come to the church and we sing we listen to our wonderful choir. We listen to the word of God. And there's no trouble at all. There's no problem at all. There is no persecution at all. And there will be a lot of gossiping in the church. A lot of busybody in the church. And there will be a lot of tears in the church. There will be a number of people who are not born again. Not children of God. But you know because the church is just a social type of community. We just come and we love it. But when persecution comes, number one all the counterfeit will drop out am i right yes. you know the people that are not really born again who are just there because of the social status that it gives you because you are part of the church immediately persecution starts the counterfeit will go uh, the tears will go the church becomes purified persecution purifies the church not only that you know even those who are believers who are children of god and before persecution were busy bodies because there's no persecution there's no trouble there's no problem did you hear what so and so did did you hear what so and so did did you hear what so and so ate? did you hear what happened to so and so immediately persecution starts gossiping stops am i right because now everybody is feeling the pain of the persecution uh, the church that is not persecuted is a prayerless church you know we're just at ease going you know the way we like and we just uh, we gossip a little we talk a little we become busy bodies and there's no prayer at all we do not search the bible the moment persecution starts the prayerless church becomes a prayerful church so persecution cleanses the church purifies the church removes the tires and uh, it takes care of gossiping in the church and pleasure seeking you know uh, there is pleasure i have my birthday you have your birthday and this is happening everything is at such ease i'm having a naming ceremony for my child but you know the moment persecution starts all that is gone everything pleasure is gone praying starts the refine of the church has started and those who really mean business with god they get on their knees well it's not only that you know persecution brings the church into unity because then we don't see our differences anymore you're educated i'm an illiterate we don't see that anymore when we're persecuted we only see one thing we see our common enemy the devil we see our common lord the lord jesus christ we see our common father god in heaven and we see our common comfort and supporter the holy ghost so persecution makes us to stop looking at our differences you are great i'm small or i'm great you are small but then all of a sudden we begin to concentrate on the same thing the same enemy the same father the same god the, the same savior the same comforter and the same cause that we're fighting for so it was a wonderful thing at this time a, a positive thing that the church the early church they, they went under persecution now let me talk about peter and john these were apostles who had been used of God to preach a great message and to perform a great miracle. Immediately they were released. You know where they went? They went to the company of believers like themselves. Listen to me. A freelance evangelist who have a difficulty. Because when you suffer persecution, and persecution will come if you're a real evangelist, but if you're freelance, no church body, no church base no company of believers who are tied to you are just roaming about from one village to the other you are roaming about from one town to the other just preaching but you don't have a body of believers that will support you and pray for you and uh, you know just back you up when persecution comes where do you go to so you know it's not just a matter of performing miracles and preaching messages you need to be identified with the body of christ and when this persecution came and when it was threatened peter and john went back to the believers 
they went to their own company. People of like, precious faith. Number one, they were humble. They didn't feel they were so great. They didn't feel they were so bold and so superior to all the other people. After all, they had been used of God in preaching and working miracles. They were humble and they, were, they had a spirit of unity. They went back to the body of Christ. And do you know that they emphasized fellowship, not only in preaching, not only in uh, talking to people, but in, in themselves. They loved fellowship. Come to Acts chapter 12. Verses 11 and 12. Here it was Peter alone. He also had been under another persecution. And when the angel came from heaven and released him and set him free, and the prison doors were open and he came out, you know what he did? He went to the believers that were praying for him. Acts 12, 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the sin, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So we can see then the importance of belonging to the body of Christ. So if you are joyful, you are joyful together. If you are suffering, you are suffering together. And you have the support, the praying, the power of the whole church backing you, praying for you. No Christian is ever so great and ever so high, ever so holy, ever so talented, ever so gifted that he can stay alone, stand alone, walk alone, minister alone. And if you are a believer, you need this whole body of Christ supporting you, helping you. So you need to keep close to the body of Christ. But another thing, in persecution, they didn't feel that, well, we'll stop confessing Christ. We'll stop uh, following Christ. It's so wonderful to see these people and to see the beautiful attitude and the beautiful spirit in them. And when they came in, in Acts chapter 4 verse 23, it says they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. Why? That's not gossiping. It says they reported. That's a report. Number one, they see that, they saw that rather, they were not isolated ministers. They were responsible to God and responsible to the people of God. And therefore all that happened to them, happened to them on behalf of the church. And therefore they had a responsibility of reporting everything. All that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. Because they were representing the church. Not only that, they were reporting back to the church because uh, this thing may happen again to any of the other apostles. And they are sharing their own experience with the body, with the elders in the church, and with the whole church was uh, granting them experience. So if this happened to any of the apostles, they will be able to know what to do. They will know where we are coming from and where we are going. That's why they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. Now, when they came together, verse 24, after they heard all this, and this is where Christian experience comes out. And this is why we know that these people were saved. I've said that before, that they were steadfast in their commitment to the Lord. Not only that, it means that they were sanctified and they were spirit-filled. Now you can tell. Now before I read verse 24, if, uh, if this persecution, if persecution came upon a, 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 an apostle, so-called apostle, or prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, or just a Christian worker, or just an ordinary Christian church member in our day, what's the first thing that, you know, the person will do? Not saved, or if they say but not sanctified, and not baptized in the Holy Ghost, he'll murmur, he'll complain, oh God, you know we're doing our best. 
Oh God, you know, we could have left that man sick and yet we just went out of our way. We healed that man in the power of the Lord in the name of Jesus. And instead of these people being happy, look at what they are doing. Oh God, are you sleeping? What are you doing in heaven? We are being persecuted. They'll murmur, they'll grumble, they'll complain. And you can tell what where they are spiritually. And they, they'll cry. And their tears, you know, will, will be flowing down. And uh, that's being spiritual when they're just being childish. But you can tell, these were adult Christians, matured Christians. And you know in verse 24, it says, And when they heard that, when they heard the, about the persecution, about the threatening, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And they said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. They started praising the Lord, worshipping the Lord. You can tell they were sanctified. We, we don't argue with anybody on sanctification. But people come to argue with us. And uh, we tell them it's better for our church that we teach sanctification because it comes out in everything. It comes out in our attitude. It comes out in our reaction. It comes out in our praying. It comes out in our lives. It comes out in our day-to-day -day living. It comes out in our response against persecution and against opposition. And it came out in them. We don't have to write it in every verse of the Bible that they were sanctified by their fruits, by their deeds, by their life. You will know because if they were not sanctified, there will not be that surrenderedness and yieldedness and submission. But they were totally purified. They were just sold out to worshiping the Lord. And this is interesting. You know what? The word here, Lord, in the original Greek is... The word they normally use for the di a dictator. That means they were saying, Lord, you own us. You can dictate to us. You can determine anything that will happen to us. You are the God of heaven. You made heaven, you made us, you made the sea, you made everything in them is. And we totally submit unto you. That's the word they're using. Lord, master, ruler, or the sovereign one. That means they were not regretting at all. They were Christians. And you'll come to that place in your Christian life where persecution doesn't bring depression upon you, discouragement upon you, distress upon you. It brings so much submission unto you. Just say, oh Lord, you are still the God of heaven, the God on earth, who made the sea and everything joyfully. You are still submitting unto the Lord. Now, in Acts chapter 16. I'm reading there from verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. That was the method of persecution in those days. I told you that in many parts of the world, that method has changed. Now, they don't call Christians now and tell them to lie down and give them the whip. They don't do that anymore. I mean, in many parts of the world. In some parts, and that's still done. They don't tie Christians to weeping posts today and then lay stripes on them. They are not concerned in persecuting you and beating your body now, but what suffers is no more your body, but it's the ego inside you. It's the personality you are defamed, you are reproached, you are, you, are, you are spoken against, you are lied against. And that is sometimes more painful than the whips on your back. And so they beat them. And they, they kept them in the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who having received such a charge, he throws them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in their stalks. Verse 25. And at midnight... Paul and Silas, they had just been beaten. Their backs were bleeding. They were just suffering persecution. Look at what they did. They prayed. What type of prayer? Oh God, the world is wicked. And we are just lonely down here. 
We need an angel to come right now and deliver us out of this place and kill all our enemies and show them that you are a great God. When you kill them, is that how they prayed? I mean, if you are not sanctified, you, you want people to be destroyed. If you are not really purified in heart, your thoughts will be running to and fro. As you are being persecuted, your heart will be saying, if an angel will come from heaven now, just as this man is raising up the wheat to beat me, just uh, hang that hand in the air. And then uh, he begins to beg me to pray for him, and I begin to laugh, saying, that's good for you, that's good for you. But you know, because they were sanctified, and, I, and I'm so serious about this, sanctification affects your response and your attitude and your reaction in persecution. So they prayed, and they sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. What does that mean? The prisoners were listening. For that's what the margin says, the Greek says, that the, the prisoners were listening. You know, when you come to the prison, well, the, the first night you spend there, you are the center of attraction. You know, the other people who have been there for six months or for one year or for two years or for five years, when a new inmate comes in, they want to know what they did. They want to know why they were there. They want to know the type of crimes they committed. And they want to know what sort of people they were. And these new people attracted attention. But you know, at midnight... In a cell of these uh, new inmates, they were hearing melodious singing. And they were hearing, think about it, their backs were still bleeding. Nobody plastered their bleeding backs. Nobody treated them. Nobody put anything to cleanse them because you read later that the Philippian jailer, when he got saved, he took them out and he washed their bleeding wounds. But they were still bleeding. And yet, all the other prisoners were hearing the song of these two men, men of God. And it, it was sort of strange to them because when anybody came to the prison, all they could hear at night was the crying and the weeping and the calling for remedy because of the terrible pain on them. But it was different. And we thank God for these examples in the Bible. And we're told in verse 26, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the prison, uh, the foundations of the prison were shaking. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Another miracle took place. The miracle doesn't come on those who murmur, those who grumble, those who complain. It comes on those who can praise the Lord in the trouble, in the persecution. Now, let's see. We've seen their praise to God. Let's see the prophecy from God's word. Inside this persecution, they remembered that uh, the Lord had said all this before. Look at verse 25. This was in their praise to God, and they brought out this wonderful prediction or prophecy from his word. God who by the mouth of thy servant David had said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. You know what they were saying? They were saying, Oh no, the people don't hate us as Peter and John. We do not matter to them. Really, they are after Christ. All that they are doing is to stop the spread of the power and the name of Jesus Christ. So it's not that uh, they hate us. Uh, the apostles recognized that this was not a personal hatred against their personality, against their persons. It was only in fulfillment of prophecy. Why did the heathen rage? Or the people imagine vain things. Then he says, the kings of the earth, they're standing up, signing authority. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. Where did they see that? In Psalm 2. Turn with me. Psalm 2. Verses 1 and 2. We learn another thing in this uh, account we're reading of the apostles. They were full of the Holy Ghost. 
but also they were full of the word of God. And if you are going to be able to face persecution very well, in a wonderful manner, scriptural manner, you must be full of the Holy Ghost and full of the scriptures at the same time. And then, because if not, when you ought to be rejoicing, you'll be crying. Psalm 2 verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth say themselves, and the rulers of the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. The word anointed is the word he put as Christ in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 20. Verse 26. So they understood that this is all in fulfillment to prophecy. But it helped them in this way. The persecution then was not a surprise to them. They knew, well, the Bible said so. God, by the mouth of his servant David, had said so. So this is no big surprise at all. It had been foretold. All that happened confirmed their faith in God's reaching word. They said, you know something? This our God is wonderful. And what surprises us is the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, that more than a thousand years before now, David, that king of Israel, had written it down, what is taking place right now. So instead of the persecution decreasing their faith in God, it increased their faith in God, established their faith in God, it confirmed their faith in God, that the word of God will be true, it will be fulfilled. God says so, it's happening now. So what's the result? Our faith is confirmed. And what you know today, if you are a reader, a student of the Bible, when persecution comes, you'll be able to know, well, the Bible says so. Instead of taking away your faith, instead of saying, well, where is my God? you know that your God is right here. He knew that this will happen before, and he said so. And because the word of God is being fulfilled, it will increase and establish and confirm your faith. Not only that, in the same prophecy, where the persecution was predicted, the outcome, the success was also predicted. So that gave them joy. They said, well, the first part of the prophecy had been fulfilled, so the second part is coming. What was the second part? Psalm 2 verse 4. He that seated in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. You see how that has been fulfilled? Because uh, the members of the Sanhedrin, they were concerned that the name of Jesus will not go beyond Jerusalem. In fact, they, they wanted to cancel that name, blot out that name in Jerusalem. You know what has happened? All over the years, Jerusalem has heard. All the land of Palestine has heard the name of Jesus. Not only that, beyond Israel, right now, all over the world, every day, there is no day that passes. There is no hour that passes. Somebody is talking in the name of Jesus. Something, somebody is mentioning the name of Jesus. Somebody is praying somewhere and is sending that prayer saying, in the name of Jesus. And that's the name they wanted to wash off and blot out of Jerusalem. They couldn't do it. So you can see that the prediction of the word of God has come true. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Not only that, do you know that uh, right now, even in the days in which we live, Jerusalem is the center of attraction. If you are, if you are reading your papers on the international level very well, uh, you can tell. No month passes in Jerusalem today without some pilgrims from all over the world going to Jerusalem. And there are, you know, all the streets in Jerusalem. I mean, right now, people are asking, where is the way to the sheep gate? 
Where is the way to the uh, to the to Solomon's porch? And where is the where is the temple where Jesus Christ did this or did that? And they, they're searching out Calvary. They're searching out uh, uh, the place where Jesus was crucified, and they're looking at the sepulchre where Jesus was buried. Jerusalem today is still feeling the impact of the fact that the name of Jesus is a great name. And people are coming all over from the world into Jerusalem and they're still talking about that name. The members of the Sanhedrin, they couldn't do it. They couldn't blot out that name in Jerusalem. And uh, you know, it's so wonderful today, almost in any nation, in the papers, you have the name of Jesus over the radio, the name of Jesus over the television, the name of Jesus. People are even using satellite now talking on the name of Jesus. Billy Graham, uh, you know, a few months ago, just came back from Russia. You know what he went to do? He went to talk to the Russians about Jesus Christ. And over the satellite, over television, millions of people were listening to him about Jesus Christ. God is wonderful. And all this is predicted in the Bible. And it says in verse 7 of Psalm 2, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the hidden for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. God is in control of everything. He was in control, and he's still in control. And what remained for the disciples and apostles or just to know that scripture is still being fulfilled. Let's see the predetermined counsel of God in Acts chapter 4. Verses 27 and 28, they continued saying of a truth. Against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do, listen to this, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. What were they saying? They were saying, no, the Sanhedrin are doing your will. You said it before. Uh, they only using them as instruments and they don't know they, they didn't know it at all uh, do you know that that is the outcome of persecution persecution doesn't draw back the church it puts it pushes the church forward persecution doesn't draw back the christian it pushes the christian forward into experiences that god had written before that uh, the christian will get into so you're under persecution as a christian don't think that that is going to draw you back, drive you back, or make you just a backslide. Never. It's for to do whatsoever thy hand, thy counsel, determine before to be done. Let me give you one illustration. God had given uh, uh, a dream to Joseph. He had said, now Joseph, you'll be a great man. And all the children of your father, they'll bow down to you. He gave him that in a dream. And Joseph called his brethren. And he told them that uh, this is my dream. They interpreted it right. They, they said, do you mean that uh, the father and the mother and everybody will be bowing down to you? Because of that, they hated him. There was great envy and jealousy. Now, they persecuted him. But did that draw back Joseph? Drive back Joseph? Did that stop the plan of God for Joseph? Listen to me. The persecution of his brethren pushed him forward. Helped him to get into the very predictions and prophetic utterances that God had given him. Number one, they sold him into Egypt so he can be a slave. Then he got into Egypt and he came into Potiphar's house. And the wife of Potiphar told a lie against him. Not persecution because it was for righteousness sake. It was because he will not commit sin. And then they threw him into the prison. But then it was out of that place he became a great man, a prime minister, so to say, in the land of Egypt. And then Jacob heard there is food in Egypt. And he sent his brethren that sold him. They have forgotten about him. And they came. You know what they did? The very thing God said they would do. They saw Joseph, they went down on their face, on their faces. They bowed down to Joseph. 
What's that? It's the fulfillment of Acts chapter 4 verse 28. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determine before to be done. Persecution leads the Christian or the church or a group of believers into the very into the very blessings of God that God had determined before. Take the case of Jesus Christ. Before the foundation of the world, God had determined that Jesus Christ will die for our sin because of our redemption, because of our salvation. Because you have in, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, saying, Jesus Christ is a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. It had been determined before that this will be the way we'll be saved. And he came to the world. The Jews hated him. Judas betrayed him. Pilate tried him. Herod ridiculed him. And the soldiers smote him. And he planted a crown of thorns and placed upon his head. What's all that doing? Fulfilling Isaiah. What's all that doing? Fulfilling the prophecies in the Old Testament. And they nailed him on the cross. They pierced his hand. What's that doing? Fulfilling what Zechariah had written down. And then he died. And he rose from the dead. And now he is our savior. Bringing redemption and salvation to us. The persecution. Worked out. The very plan of salvation of God. Understand that when you are under persecution. God is not forgetting you. He will be working out this plan in your life. And if the church is under persecution. The Lord will be working out his plan for that church. But you only need to be sharp and spirit filled. To see that this is the direction the Lord wants you to go. Let me go back to Joseph. Uh, you, you ask a question. Did Joseph know that. All this was working out the very plan of God. Oh yes, he knew. In Genesis chapter 20, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 50. Genesis 50, verse 20. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. But as for you, Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass, you hear that? To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. That's always the reason that God permits persecution. I've told you before, it purifies the church. It drives away the counterfeit from the church. It cancels gossiping and pleasure-seeking from the church. It sends the church on, on her knees. It makes the church prayerful. And it makes the church stick together, come together in communion and fellowship. Now come back to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read to you again from verse 24 because I want to emphasize something to you. You can only get it as you see the flow of the whole passage. Let me show you the background again. They were under persecution. They had just come before the council of the priests. They have been threatened. They mustn't mention the name of Jesus anymore. And they threatened them. If you do that, you'll be in trouble. And now look at um, from verse 24. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, where the Gentiles were, and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. The emphasis I'm bringing to you is there was persecution. Now they came to pray. You see that they mentioned the problem only in one little sentence. 
That was prayer in the early church. In the early church, prayer meant the praises of God. Prayer meant the glory of God. Prayer meant worshipping God. Prayer meant just telling God how good God is, how wonderful God is, how great God is, how marvelous God is, how infinite His grace is, how gracious the Lord is. And you can see they just started praising the Lord. They started right from creation. Think about prayer. Starting from Genesis and coming to Psalms and just talking about the goodness of God, the grace of God, the power of God, the might of God, and the, the word of God. They just went on and on and on, praising God. And then be, before they, they ended the prayer, they said, well, only behold, they are threatening. Just in one sentence. Is that how you pray? No. When you're under persecution, how do you pray? You come before God in tears. You never remember anything God has done for you. You never remember the good things, the great things, the miracles, the marvelous things. You come before God and uh, you talk about the problem and your tears are flowing. And you talk about the problem for one hour. And then you mention the goodness and the greatness of God for five minutes. Oh yes, God, we know you are a wonderful God, but all the same, we are depressed and discouraged and we are running out of our power, of our grace. And if you don't do something quick, quick, we shall backslide. But you know, they just praised the Lord. And if you can change your prayer pattern, and just begin to praise him. Because according to the Bible, according to the word of God in the Psalms, the Lord inhabited the praises of his own children, the praise of Israel. And so they praised him. And in one single sentence, they said, Lord, behold their threatenings. But it's weighty. Verse 29. They emphasize the word now. They said, Lord, this is the time. We know you worked in days gone by. We know you showed your power in days gone by. We know your power will be shown again when Jesus will come and he will fight with the sword of his mouth and he will establish his kingdom. But now, O oh Lord, behold their threatening. We need that power now. We need that glory now. We need the manifestation of who you are now. And then they said, Lord, behold their threatenings. That's all they needed to say. Because if he beheld it, if he saw it, he'll do something about it. And of course he'll do something because it will be in fulfillment to the prophetic writings and the Psalms I've read to you. Now verse 29. This is wonderful. What, they were, what were they asking for? What is it they were asking for? Now, Suppose you were, what will we be asking for? Again, if we're not sanctified, if we're not really holy and purified, if we're not loving, loving God and loving people and loving the persecutors and wishing the blessing of, of God on them, our prayers will tell. You know, some other people will pray that God will destroy their enemies. They didn't pray that way, not at all. Or uh, they might just uh, pray that, Lord, uh, they will escape and there will be no problem anymore. You know the prayer of little children. When you gather little children to Sunday school and uh, you begin to teach uh, little children the first lessons in the Bible about Adam and Eve, about Cain and Abel, about the flood, about the things that happened in those days. And you tell those little, little children that the cause of all the trouble is Satan. You know the prayer of little children? Oh God, since you are all powerful, kill Satan. And you know that's still the prayer of many Christians. Now, oh God, if you, can, if you can just kill Satan, there will be no trouble anymore. So everything will just come to normal. Or if you don't kill Satan, kill our enemies. But these were apostles. The apostles were matured in faith, matured in understanding. They, they really knew how to pray. And they said, and grant unto thy servants, the Greek is just the slaves, the sor those who are surrendered totally to the Lord, the submissive ones that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Now they asked for boldness. But then, 
we need more than boldness. Because these apostles had walked with Jesus Christ. Whenever the Pharisees came to ask questions from Jesus Christ, they saw the heavenly wisdom from Jesus Christ giving the answers. And uh, that wisdom came on them. In fact, if you read your Bible very well in Acts of the Apostles, when they were, when they were going to choose the deacons, they were looking for people that were full of power, of the Spirit of God, of faith, and of wisdom. And we need all that together. We need wisdom, we need faith, we need power, and we need the Spirit in its, in its fullness. Here they were asking for boldness. If you are bold and you don't have wisdom, you, you'll destroy the work of God. You can be bold and aggressive, but you are not wise. But these people already had the Spirit of God. They had the wisdom of God. They had faith, the faith of the Son of God. All they were asking for now is, Oh Lord, we're trusting you that when the situation arises, the wisdom will be there, the faith will be there, the message will be there, the Scriptures will be coming to us, and the Spirit will still be there. We're asking for boldness now that will be able to speak that word in boldness, and then you'll be stretching forth your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Now the prayer was answered by God. Verse 31. And when they prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together today is the people that shake when they pray the building doesn't shake in those days the people did not shake but the building shook you know we're totally different today because the power does not come to shake the foundations because the power does not come to shake everything shakeable out of your way to be able to preach the gospel therefore because the power will not come like something of old who has lost the power you shake your body it wasn't like that in those days they just allowed the power to flow through them and the Lord decided and determined what ought to be shaken. We're told when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together and they were all listening to this filled with the Holy Ghost they were filled before they are now filled again and they speak the word of God with boldness verse 33 and great power with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all you see the answer to the prayer? Great grace came. Great power came. Great boldness came. And today, as we pray, if you are not saved yet, you ought to get saved very quickly. Because if persecution comes at any time, the first people to be affected will be the counterfeit, the tires, the unsaved. Uh, it will just shake you out of the church, throw you out of the church. But then, if you are saved, get sanctified. Because it's when you get sanctified and purified and made holy, you'll have the right attitude, the right response. You'll have, you know, the right uh, inward feeling all through the persecution. Your prayer will be directed and channeled in the right way. Then if you are not filled with the Holy Ghost, you can see the emphasis in the passages we're reading. They were full of the Spirit and they were being filled with the Holy Ghost. If you were full of the Holy Ghost before, but now you are not totally yielded under the control of the Holy Ghost, come under the control of the Spirit again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you, if you don't have wisdom, you know that when, when you are called for questioning, you say some foolish things. It's later you remember what you should have said. You need to pray for wisdom. And if your faith has been shaking, you need to pray for faith. And you need to pray that the Lord will just put the word in your heart and bring the right word at the right time and make you to see that everything that happens to you is just a fulfillment of scripture. So in persecution, you need to have those seven principles I talked to you about. And then you need to uh, have the spirit of God, the word of God. You, have, you need boldness and wisdom. Uh, you need all that God can give you so that the persecution 
will be made a plus in your life, not a minus. Positive, not negative. And will lead you, usher you, and drive you into more fellowship with God and with His own people. If you are suffering persecution right now, be comforted. God cannot forget you. He knows you. He knows what you are going through. He'll work everything out to your advantage at last. Let's end up with Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know, you must know this, that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to his purpose. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written. For thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May that be true of every one of us. Rise up and let us pray. Persecution will come, one form or the other. Various sizes or shapes or forms. What's going to be your reaction in persecution? Don't let the praises of God cease from your mouth. Whatever the condition, whatever the problem, just keep on praising the name of the Lord, knowing all things work together for good to them who are called, who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose.